Port Aventura is the premier theme park destination in Spain. This is a highly themed park that also offers some awesome roller coasters. This combination reminds me of the Busch Gardens Park stateside, and that's most certainly a good thing. So in this video, I will review Port Aventura and explain why this resort needs to be on everyone's bucket list. Port Aventura opened back in 1995. Despite the success of the resort, the ownership has been somewhat of a revolving door. Anheuser-Busch originally had a 20% stake in the park, and that may explain why it reminds me so much of the Busch Gardens parks. But the majority owners in opening day were two sods with a 40% stake. In 1998, Universal purchased two sods shares and renamed the property Universal's Port Aventura. During their tenure, they expanded the complex to be a full-fledged resort with multiple hotels and a water park. In 2004, Universal sold their shares to La Caixa, who had been a minority stakeholder from day one. The Universal name was dropped, but they continued to expand the resort's offerings, both from a ride and accommodation perspective. Then in 2013, KKR became the primary stakeholder and has been for the past decade. However, there are rumors that Universal may once again buy the property. There have been some interesting trademarks that have filed in the past year. While I love the resort as is, this makes me even more excited for the property's future. Between Universal's recent investments and superior operations, this could elevate Port Aventura into the discussion as Europe's best park. But until that happens, if it even happens, let's talk about the resort as is. Port Aventura is located in Salus, Spain. This is a resort town offering some stunning views. Not only is it right against the sea, but you have some gorgeous mountains in the background. And Port Aventura's tallest rides use the setting to their advantage to offer some breathtaking visuals. Not only is Salou scenic, but it's highly accessible. It's roughly 65 miles southwest of Barcelona. It's just over an hour drive, and they charge roughly 12 euros per day to park your car. Alternatively, you can use public transit. This is how I've always accessed the park. Going to or from downtown Barcelona, the best method is the Renfe train. The Port Aventura station is just a half mile walk to the park's main entrance. There are several trains per day, and you buy tickets directly at the station the day of. The journey takes one and a half hours and costs just under 10 euros. Going to or from the Barcelona airport, you can take the bus. It's operated by Bus Plana. This costs just under 20 euros per person. There are multiple buses per day, but I recommend booking your ticket in advance because they can sell out. The journey takes one and a half to two hours, and it stops each of the resort's six hotels all of which are a short walk to the main entrance. I'll come back to these later in the review. While on the topic of accessibility, it is worth noting most employees are bilingual. Most speak basic English on top of Spanish here. This is a major help for foreign visitors who may not be fluent in Spanish. But even if you encounter the rare employee who may not speak any English, they are super helpful and will refer you to someone who can. Once you reach the resort, you have a central plaza that accesses the three parks. You have the primary park, which is known as Port Aventura Park. Then you have the Costa Caribe Water Park, which opened back in 2002. I have not been there because I've always visited Port Aventura during the cooler months, but it looks to have a solid slide lineup and a tropical atmosphere. It sort of gives me Typhoon Lagoon vibes. Then you have Ferrari Land, which opened in 2017. This is a small theme park themed to the famous Italian sports car. In many ways, this feels like a big land rather than a full-fledged theme park. Check out my review on Ferrari Land if you want to know more about that park. You have several different admission options if you're visiting Port Aventura. Single-day tickets cost 40 to 60 euros, with the higher costs occurring during busier times like summer and Halloween weekends. You can turn your ticket into a park hopper that includes Ferrari Land for an extra 10 to 15 euros, which is a fantastic deal. That's worth it alone for Red Force or you can turn your ticket into a two-day ticket for an extra 20-ish euros. Now, one weird quirk I've had buying tickets online for this park is that my Visa cards have been denied each time. I have not had that issue in person, but I've always had to use my MasterCard online to buy Port Aventura tickets for some reason. I think you need one and a half days at Port Aventura Park to experience it in full. That gives you enough time to not only experience the major attractions, but you can also soak up the atmosphere and take in a few shows then the remaining half day should be allocated to Ferrari Land. If you only care about the roller coasters, 
It is possible to do both Ferrari Land and Port Aventura in a single day, but you are doing yourself a disservice rushing through this park and bypassing everything else it has to offer. Before you visit, definitely check the park's hours. Unlike many parks in Europe that close super early, Port Aventura is famous for staying open late. In peak season, it's not uncommon to see the park open until 11pm or even midnight. These days will be busier, but you have 13-14 to 14 hours to see everything, which is super nice. Then on some days, certain areas will stay open later than the rest of the park. You will typically see this with Mediterranea and the far west section because both those areas are towards the front of the park and have separate entrances into the on-site hotels. Now this park is massive. Port Aventura Park alone covers nearly 130 acres. The park more or less forms a giant loop, but there is a pathway through China cutting through the center of the park. This park is comprised of six themed areas, all of which have their own distinct feel and are very well done. Most are themed to ancient civilizations, with the lone exception being the primary kids area. This is one of the prettiest parks in the world because of how it blends natural beauty with ornate architecture. The first area is Mediterranea. The entry area is admittedly pretty narrow, but it's beautiful when you reveal the park. You have a pond in front of you, and in the distance, you see the park's taller rides and the final turnaround of Furious Baco, which is the area's lone ride. The rest of this land is filled with shops and restaurants, giving it the vibe of a waterfront town, and the light color palette gives it a bright and cheery atmosphere. Continuing counterclockwise, you'll reach Polynesia. This feels like a tropical island with a lush vegetation. It is the park's greenest area by far. Next is Sesamo Aventura. This is a colorful land themed to Sesame Street. This is the best section for kids by far. You'll find a dozen or so rides here, all of which are suited for younger guests. And you also have several shows and meet and greets with all the popular characters. I do find it a bit weird that Woody Woodpecker doesn't have his own themed area or ride anywhere in the park, because he's the resort's official mascot. You will find plenty of merchandise with him on it though. Kids love this character in Spain. Right next to Sesamo Aventura is China. This is the go-to place for thrill seekers because you have the two hulking B&Ms in Shambhala and Dragon Con. You can see these coasters from anywhere within the park, but they're especially imposing up close. This area doesn't have much shade, but I think this section has the park's best looking buildings with all the ancient temples. Then comes Mexico. This area uses the greenery of Polynesia while also throwing in ancient ruins for any building or facade. It is a really nice combination. The final land is far west. Many European parks have a wild west themed area, but this is one of the best executed ones. It's considerably larger than most and the aesthetic is spot on with the high reliance on wooden rides and structures. In general, this park nails the presentation aspect. The park is clean, rides seem to sport fresh coats of paint, and the signature rides have these grand entrances. The one downside is that the queue lines themselves leave much to be desired. Most are a miserable series of switchbacks without much in terms of theming. You do not want to get stuck in these lines on a hot summer day. That brings me to what's often considered the biggest flaw with the resort, the ride operations. I have only visited this park in the quieter and cooler periods, but from what I can see, the operators check and dispatch trains relatively quickly. The big issue is how many trains are on the course at once. On quiet days, this park tends to run their rides at reduced capacities, so you'll see just one train on rides like Shambhala and Dragon Con, which can cause those rides to move at a snail's pace. That is one reason why I highly recommend the Express Pass if you encounter any crowds. You can buy these day of either at a kiosk, vending machine across the park, or online. You have several tiers to pick from. You have the Express Max, which allows you to skip each ride once. These will cost you 35 to 50 euros depending on the day. Or you have the Express Premium, which allows you to skip the included rides as many times as you'd like. These cost 60 to 80 euros. These almost always get you on the next train for each ride, so they are a major time saver. Then for 5 euros extra on either level, you can add a single front row ride on the three main coasters. That brings me to my next point of contention. Choice seating is not guaranteed on any ride. When you reach the station, the attendant will let just enough people through the turnstiles to fill the next train. On some rides, 
seating is assigned, and on others it's first come. You typically cannot wait an extra train for a specific row, but it doesn't hurt to ask an operator just in case they let you. From what I've seen, they will honor seating requests for any vacant row though. If you want a specific seat, your best bet is to linger behind the turnstile and just let people pass you. Another advantage of Express is that you're almost always one of the first parties into the station, so you often get first picket seats. The front row is just blocked off in the three big coasters unless you purchase that 5 euro upcharge. One other thing to be aware of is that this park uses staggered openings. Both Shambhala and El Diablo typically open a half hour after the front gate. Hurricane Condor opens an hour late. Then the wood coasters usually open 90 minutes late. On the bright side, this park does keep their queue lines open right until the posted closing time at least. Lastly, pay attention to the weather. Many European parks will run their coasters in rain, but I saw Port Aventura close their major coasters in a steady rainfall. Then if you happen to visit on a very windy day, the B&Ms may operate with just one train if they even open. Knowing that, how would you want to attack this park? Assuming good weather, I would recommend starting with Furious Baco if, and this is a big if, you are one of the first people through the turnstiles. Since this is the closest ride to the main entrance, the line spikes shortly after opening. If you are one of the first people in line, you have a good chance of getting the front row, which is far and away the best seat on this launch coaster. The next priority should be Street Mission. In my recent visit, this dark ride routinely had the longest wait in the entire park. If you don't get to this ride early, you have two options. Either hop in line right before closing time, or you can purchase a single shot express ticket for 7 euros a person. By now, it should be a half hour after opening, and Shambhala should be operational. I recommend getting a few laps in this coaster while the line is short, especially in the back row. That's my favorite row in this mega coaster. If you return later in the day, there is a single rider line. How fast that moves depends on how many trains are in use. After Shambhala, I would hit Dragon Con because it's nearby. By now, it should be an hour after opening, so it's a great time to hit Hurricane Condor. The reason it's important to hit this ride early is because it has three different sides. Sit down, sit down tilt, and stand up floorless tilting. You are randomly assigned to a side. I don't agree with that because the sides are radically different, but that's what the park typically does. So if you go here when it doesn't have a line, you can usually request which side you want. It is also worth noting this ride has a single rider line as well. You can access it halfway through the queue line, and it's a major time saver midday. Logically, I would think you'd want to hit the wood coasters next if you can get there right when they open up. However, when I tried that on my recent trip, they already had a long line of guests queuing up. So while you may have to wait for the wood coasters and water rides on a hot day, this strategy should let you knock out the park's 5 best rides in the first 90 minutes of operation. That's key because each of these rides can easily get a 45-60 to 60 minute wait or more on busy days. I do like how this park has queue time boards throughout the park to help you see which areas are busy throughout the day. Now let's move on to the ride lineup. Port Aventura really shines here. This park currently features 7 different roller coasters and number 8 is on the way. This will be named Uncharted and is themed after the video game and film franchise. This will be an indoor coaster from Intamin with 5 different launches and it's expected to have some nice theming. An enclosed coaster is much appreciated addition for days with less than ideal weather. Of their currently operating coasters, their lineup is very well balanced. For airtime, you have Shambhala. This is their best coaster by far. This is my favorite Balger and Mabillard hyper coaster anywhere. Not only is it considerably larger than most, but it has some truly impressive drops. Each offers some of the best and most sustained floater airtime of any coaster and some even offer that free fall sensation if you sit further back in the train. Along with all that airtime, you have beautiful views of the nearby water and mountains. This ride is super smooth too, making it one of the most re-rideable coasters in the world. See my review for more details. Dragon Con is located directly underneath Shambhala. This is one of the few B&M sit-down coasters, and it's a forceful one. It opened with the most inversions of any coaster in the world with 8, and most pack a punch. I especially love the insane whip on the Zero-G roll. While this coaster can't quite match the tenacity of Kumba, 
It does have more oomph than a lot of the B&Ms built over the past two decades. This fills the need for a multi-looper perfectly, and it's thankfully riding quite smoothly, as I noted in a review. Furious Baco is the park's launch coaster. This is a weird one from Intamin. It's an accelerator coaster with wing seating. The initial hydraulic launch is very strong, shooting you to 84 miles per hour or 135 kilometers per hour in just three and a half seconds. And despite all that speed, the rest of the layout hugs the ground. It's odd seeing a ride this fast never get more than four stories off the ground. This causes you to fly through the layout. The only two other notable elements are this dip after the launch with great airtime, and the barrel roll later in the ride with incredible hang time. The one downside with this coaster is that it's very rough, particularly on the edge seats as you move further back in the train. See my review for more details. Stampeda is the park's racing wood coaster from CCI. I really like this ride's layout. It's neat how the two tracks are intertwined. You get some neat visuals because of this. The first half is some solid airtime, and the turns are minimally banked, so you get good laterals. There are two downsides with this coaster, though. One, there is a trim break in the first drop that causes you to come to a crawl by the end of the layout. Two, it can run rough, especially as you move further back in the train. Intertwined with Stampeda is Tomahawk. This is the park's family wooden coaster, also from CCI. It's smoother than its big brother, and it's quite good for its size. You get some decent laterals on the turns, and you even get a little bit of airtime towards the end. Another good family coaster is El Diablo. This is the only Aero mine train you'll find in Europe. It's a long ride. The first and final third are good. You have some fun turns with a bit of force to them. And you have a neat setting going over rides or through tunnels. The pacing is hurt by all the lift hills though, and a lackluster middle section, but ultimately it is a solid mine train. The final coaster is Tammy Tammy, which serves as the park's junior coaster. This is your basic Vacoma roller skater. While the layout is not original, it is a comfortable experience for kids and parents to enjoy together. Moving on to the flat rides, Port Aventura does not offer as much as some other parks, but they do have some notable ones. The crown jewel is Hurricane Condor. This is a 33-story tall Intamin drop tower, so you get some spectacular views of the resort and surroundings. And if you ride in the stand-up tilting floorless seats, it has a case as the world's scariest drop tower. You only tilt 15 degrees at the top, but that drop is incredible. It lasts forever, you get a strong stomach drop sensation, and that tilt forces you to stare at the ground. And you get good floater airtime the whole way down especially in the stand-up side because you have quite a bit of clearance between your shoulders and the harness. And the landing isn't nearly as brutal as you may expect when you see the seating position. See my review for more. The other flat ride I've known is Serpiente Emplamata. This is a unique Schwarzkopf spinning ride where you sit in discs that spin very fast. Then the arms also bounce you up and around. This ride has a long cycle, and you get some good centripetal forces from the spinning. You then have a few other spinning rides scattered about the park that are nice to jump on midday, especially because they rarely have much of a wait. Then kids will want to spend much of their time in Sesamo Aventura. This really is one of the better kids areas out there between the quantity of attractions and the fact parents can ride most of them with their younger ones. Then there's also this giant play area that kids love. This area also is the park's signature dark ride and street mission. This is a trackless shooting dark ride it's mostly a screen-based shooter, but you have the occasional animatronic, plus some physical targets to take aim at. I like how each scene has its own distinct feel to prevent the ride from getting repetitive. There was no shortage of targets, and the guns worked flawlessly. The one weird thing with this ride is that the larger targets are the ones actually worth more points. I'm used to it being the other way around, which made this one a bit easier than I would have liked. You also have two other indoor attractions in the Mexico section. First, you have Secreto de los Mayas. This is the world's hardest mirror maze. Not only is it large, but there's an opening in the center with a turntable, so it's exceedingly easy to get lost and have no idea where you're going. Second, you have Templo del Fuego. I've heard very good things about this attraction because it combines a show with special effects, but it typically doesn't operate in the off-season when I visited the park. If you visit during this time period, 
you also may find some of the water rides closed. So check the hours prior to visiting because this park is really strong in this area if you care about them. And that makes sense given how high the temperature can get in the summer. Ironically, the River Rapids ride is the driest, which is why it was open this past year during Christmas. Grand Canyon Rapids only has a single rapid that can get you wet, but this intimate creation does a lot of other things well. You move through the trough at a good clip, and there's some excellent rock work all around the attraction. Then there is a water cannon towards the end that can get you soaked, but it's inconsistent. Silver River Flume is a mock log flume that interacts with El Diablo, and also features three drops. The first two are small, but the final one is quite large. This one can be a soaker. Not only will your upper body get doused, but the logs frequently fill with water, which can get your shoes uncomfortably wet, so be prepared. Tutuki Splash is my favorite of the water rides. This is a well-themed Intamin Shoot the Shoots ride. It has an extended layout with two drops. The larger of the two is a double down that can give some shocking airtime because you have zero restraints. And as you'd expect, the splashes will get you quite wet. The final water ride I've known is Angkor. This is a splash battle set behind Shambhala. This has caused the ride to be a ghost town the one time I experienced it, which negatively impacts this type of ride that thrives off of riders and onlookers interacting with each other. The final ride of note is a train that circles around the park. This is a convenient way to get from land to land considering the scale of the park, and I like how each station estimates the next departure time. Beyond the rides, Port Aventura also does an excellent job with their shows. I would prioritize whichever one is in the Grand Tetro Imperial. This past year, I saw Un Paso de Tu Corazon during their Christmas event, and it is one of the best shows I've ever seen at any theme park. The production value was top notch, the music was good, and the stunts were awe inspiring to see. The park also tends to end the day with a bang. They regularly have a parade at park closing time, followed by some sort of nighttime spectacular. This could range from fireworks to some sort of show on the water. For Christmas, they had a series of barges and these stuntmen riding around in water jetpacks. It was a sight to behold. Now I've referenced their Christmas event a few times. I highly recommend visiting during this time period. There are three main benefits. 1. Ride lines tend to be shorter than any other season. 2. You will avoid the blistering Spanish sun. 3. You have those wonderful Christmas shows I mentioned. The biggest downside to this time of year is that most of the water rides will be closed, but it may be worth it for you if those aren't a major priority. Their Christmas events also have different hours than other ones. Most parks open and close later to maximize their evening hours to showcase the lights. Port Aventura opens at its usual time and closes right around sundown. There aren't too many lights across the park, but they go all out in Mediterranean, decorating the buildings. Then you have the parade and nighttime spectacular in that area as well. That more than makes up for it. I have heard good things about this park's Halloween event, but I haven't personally experienced it. Now let's talk about food. To be honest, I have been a bit underwhelmed by the food I've had within the park's boundaries. I've tried food in a few different locations, and it's just been okay at best. The one place I do want to highlight is La Liga. This is a soccer themed restaurant just outside the park's main gate. This place has a cool atmosphere, and I think it has the tastiest food at the resort. On that note, let's talk about the hotels. There are six of them. All of them are excellent. Five of them are four-star resorts. Then Lucy's Mansion is a five-star resort. I highly recommend the four-star resorts. They are an amazing value. I've been able to get them for roughly 150 euros per night. Not only do you get a really nice room in a convenient location, but they also include theme park tickets. So when you add everything up, especially if you're coming as a family, that is one heck of a deal. Lucy's Mansion usually costs twice as much, which is why I haven't stayed there. Which hotel you choose comes down to personal preference. Hotel Caribe looks nice, it has a tropical vibe, and it's a 10 minute walk from the train station, but it's also a 10 minute walk from the main entrance, making it the furthest hotel. My personal favorite hotel is Hotel Port Aventura. I think this is the most convenient hotel. The room we had on our recent trip was quite literally a 10 second walk to the main entrance. You cannot beat that anywhere else. This hotel carries over the Mediterranean aesthetic of the front section of the park. If you're coming by train and have lots of bags, 
I would recommend Hotel El Paso. This is the closest hotel to the train station. It's just a two to three minute walk from there. You then have an extra five to six minutes to the main entrance. That walk is a lot easier when you are carrying all your belongings, especially because the walk is partially uphill and rough with the pavement. I would avoid Gold River, Colorado Creek, and Lucy's Mansion if you're coming by train. Because those are on the other side of the resort, those are roughly one and a half mile walks to the station. These hotels are nice though, and there is a separate gate into the park in the far west area. But it is a little weird because the rides over there don't open until one and a half hours after the rest of the park, so you're at a disadvantage at rope drop. The four star resorts each have a buffet. This is your best food option if you're on site without a car. You have a wide range of offerings and the quality was solid for a buffet. You can walk to downtown Salou if you're in the hotels closer to the train station. But there wasn't much open past park closing time, especially in the quieter seasons. If you don't care where you stay, they offer a system called Hotel Roulette. You get a cheaper rate and then you're randomly assigned a hotel based on availability a day or two before you arrive. I'd rather just get my hotel of choice, but this will save you a few bucks. One other perk to staying on site is that you get free admission to the big tourist attractions at Tarragona. This is a nearby town that's just a 20 minute train ride away with some classic Roman buildings. If you're into history, this should not be missed. So do I recommend Port Aventura? 100%. This is one of the best theme park resorts in the world. The main park is one of the best in Europe. The way the park blends immersive theming with some top-notch attractions is wonderful. Shambhala is a truly world-class attraction, and the rest of the ride and show offerings are strong too. And beyond the main park, you also have Ferrari Land nearby, and the really nice accommodations I just touched on. The only areas I think this place could use improvement are in the operations and food departments but there are workarounds for each of these. So those are my thoughts on Port Aventura, both the main park and the overall resort. What are your thoughts on Spain's premier amusement destination? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.